Good evening and welcome to the February 28th, 2018 meeting of the Falmouth Conservation Commission. Uh, we're not having any hearings tonight, instead we're having a special joint meeting with the Water Quality Management Committee and the Falmouth Board of Health to discuss um, a number of things relative to our the state of our coastal ponds and um, the comprehensive wastewater management plan and the um, the main focus um, is going to be on alternative innovative septic systems and we will have a presentation from Virginia Valiella of the Water Quality Management Committee on that topic. It's our first order of business. Okay, thank you, Mary. Uh, can we darken the lights a little bit over the screen so the audience has a better view? Um, okay, thank you for, for calling this joint meeting. I, I think it's a historic event. Uh, <laughs> Uh, following the joint uh, meeting that the selectmen held on a Saturday uh, several weeks ago. Um, we, we appreciate the opportunity to present um, what we've been working on, uh, particularly with innovative alternative septic systems. And we wanted to give some context, both for viewers at home and, and in the audience. I know many of the technical points are already known to the board here, but just to, to set the stage, basically. So here you start with your, your, your house. Uh, you, I hope you have a septic system, a uh, septic tank, uh, which collects solids. Um, and then there is some sort of drain field, or sometimes called soil absorption system, uh, where the liquid uh, flows out and then percolates down to the groundwater. That uh, leachate carries with it various dissolved constituents. One of them is nitrate, sometimes also ammonia. Uh, and so S Title V septic system, even though it's the legal approved septic system, does not remove something that the salt water estuaries uh, have a great deal of difficulty dealing with. When there are many houses, uh, we begin to get algae blooms and then ultimately anoxic events and then fish kills. So, going to the next slide. It is possible to add something to the treatment train uh, that will help remove the nitrogen. And there are a variety of uh, uh, vendors uh, in the marketplace. It either involves additional treatment between the septic tank and the, the drain field, or sometimes it involves the drain field as well. Um, and it may, the, the distribution may be dosed rather than um, uh, just um, all continuously. You still end up with effluent reaching the groundwater and moving to the estuaries. Next slide. The Massachusetts <coughs> Department of Environmental Protection uh, has a number of systems that they have removed. Uh, and IA stands for Innovative and Alternative Systems. And they have several classifications. The point is these are sort of off the shelf. Uh, and available now uh, for uh, engineers in town uh, if they're redesigning your, your septic uh, system can go to this list. They only remove about 19 milligrams of nitrogen per liter. Um, it is presumed, just as a working number, that there are 38 milligrams per liter that leach out of your, uh, your drain field. So this is a 50% removal. Next slide. The in, we are very fortunate that in Barnstable County, we have a septic system test center. It's run by George Hoyfelter. <coughs> and they have been tracking all of the IA systems uh, on the Cape, and they have this data published. Uh, it's available on the web. Um, for, for everything that has been installed for, I believe, the last 20 years. And from that data, George has calculated that on average, uh, the installed systems uh, achieve 19 milligrams per liter, that goal that the state set, uh, about 70% of the time. Um, this is better than not having anything, but clearly we have quite a ways to go to remove the nitrogen. And there are more promising technologies coming along, just as you would expect in, in any field. Um, they're not in common usage yet, and um, they uh, haven't been permitted, but there is a process by which they can be installed. And that's where the leadership of the Buzzards Bay Coalition 
uh, and the Water Quality Committee with our technical assistant, uh, Sia, have been working in West Falmouth. Um, we have uh, in process, some installed, some still in the permitting uh, stage, this list that you see up there. The uh, treatment system that is slightly different are the black water holding tanks. Those are only for summer cottages. They're only for seasonal habitation. Uh, they are permitted through the Board of Health. Um, and uh, as you'll see from the data, they do effectively remove nitrogen because they basically hold it in a tank and then send it to the treatment plant where it gets treated to three milligrams per liter. So it's a win. Uh, but in terms of on-site tre treatment, you have the limonite hoot, something that is vernacularly called the layer cake, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Drip dispersal, which is a, um, a Perkrite, uh, I think is the brand name, um, which basically does a better job in the soil absorption system of letting the nitrification process occur. And then these last two, Nitro and Fuji Clean, which are at this point um, moving through the permitting and engineering. Um, here are, is a picture of just to give you an idea because they're, they all look quite different. Um, the layer cake is actually uh, various layers of soils and sand uh, with carbon um, mixed in with the sand. Um, and then on top, is the distribution system that allows the effluent to be, to cover the entire drain field uh, and it's dosed. And so it comes out those little white pipes uh, and then there are little valves there and they connect, they're in the process of, of uh, hooking up the, the dispersal uh, layer. Uh, the eliminite has uh, a media uh, which provides a lot of surface uh, and that uh, aids the nitrification, denitrification. The hoot, to me, is just two black boxes. If you want to know more, we'll have to ask Sia. Uh, <laughs> and the black water storage tank is, is a holding tank. Okay. The project looked at properties within 300 feet of the West Falmouth Harbor shoreline. And we, uh, so the group that, that sort of from which we might find candidate properties totaled 170, which is lot of properties. The key figure, we really are interested in properties within 600 feet of the shoreline uh, because basically uh, properties or septic systems that 600 feet or less to the shoreline, the nitrogen basically goes to the groundwater and then because of the rate of the groundwater exits, exits into the estuary with, with virtually no attenuation, no dilution, it just, it, you could basically just dump it in the harbor. Um, but for this project, we focused on properties that were within 300 feet. All right. Uh, we've had two years. Uh, we've had 20 installations with 10 more coming. Um, and we've, uh, everybody asked, well, how much does it cost? Uh, so this is sort of um, a composite of the uh, costs from the 20 that uh, we have installed and maybe a few more that we can project. Um, we're presuming a three bedroom home and a simple installation. The landscaping is a key piece for the additional cost, whether you have to move a lot of bushes, whether you have to repave a driveway. Um, so that's a, that's a variable. But if there were no landscaping issues, then your regular Title V system costs about $12,000, $13,000. Uh, and you will have 3,300 3, in engineering plans uh, and permitting processes. And the extra piece of equipment that's in the, the treatment train uh, averages just about $10,000. So that's the grant that in this project uh, has been provided to the homeowners. That's their incentive. So they basically are cost neutral. You're getting a new Title V system. Uh, but it's better treated because of this uh, additional uh, element. Next. Here's the performance data we have so far. The black water, uh, which is the holding tank, 92% removal of the, of the nitrogen, um, <laughs> which is amazing. It means that your dishwasher, your sink, your shower has 8% of the nitrogen load and everything else uh, comes from us. Um, for the hoot, we have seven sites, and the, the result there was 72% removal. 
Uh, the Eliminate um, two sites um, came in at 82 <coughs> percent. Excuse me. Um, the 62 percent, they were doing a renovation of the house and they were using lots of solvents and we think that that, that, that <coughs> underperformed because the solvents were poured down the drain and that does happen. Uh, the layer cake again is what George Hoyfelter is working on and we only have one in West Falmouth but he's working on about a dozen that will be around uh, Buzzards Bay. So um, when that study is complete there will be another report that's specifically about the layer cake. The regulatory authorities that would be involved in an IA are uh, always the Board of Health, uh, sometimes the Conservation Commission, uh, and depending on the kind of project, you might have the Zoning Board or the Planning Board doing site, site review. Um, you play a very important role because anything that's, any project that's within 100 feet of a resource area triggers and, and comes across your desk. Um, the fertilizer bylaw applies townwide and we are incredibly grateful and uh, that it is now a standard condition in, in all your orders of condition. Uh, and the coastal pond overlay district, and I'm going to show you a map in just a minute, would apply to many parcels but we are finding that it really, even though it's, you know, it's, it's mapped, um, it only triggers when you have a development that's more than five acres or five lots, it's a commercial development that needs a site plan, or it has to have a special permit and it's within <coughs> 2,000 feet. So, so it's, it's at best a moderate fit. It's not, not, not all encompassing as we had hoped. Next. So here are 15 impaired estuaries. These have all had uh, studies by the Massachusetts Estuaries Project. Uh, they almost all have um, targeted maximum daily load set. Um, and as you can see, they cover a large part of the town. Um, of those 15, there are five uh, that are missing from the town's zoning map. And I think it's really that the, re the reports or the studies weren't done at the time the zoning was voted. So at the fall town meeting, that is something that we will want to correct. But they are mapped. Um, this is, map is consistent with the Cape Cod Commission and the U.S. Uh, Geological Survey. Um, and it will work for our, our town zoning map as well. So we have 15 estuaries. Um, uh, Eric Turkington, our chairman at, at the joint meeting with the selectmen said, when you're in a hole, stop digging. We have 15 holes. And that's basically why we're here tonight. <coughs> uh, next. Of those 15, we, the, the committee has examined the water, each watershed and looked at what, how much nitrogen there was, what are the tools available to us, can we meet the total maximum daily load? That's that TMDL up there. And it turns out that for five watersheds, we are going to have to sewer over a period of time. Um, Little Pond sewer was just completed. Um, and up, way up in the north there, Wild Harbor uh, has, that's New Silver Beach, um, that has a sewer um, and appears to have been effective based on early data we're looking at. Um, but we still have Great Pond. I uh, see, I don't know whether you could perhaps just indicate this. Okay, Great Pond um, is that. And we're talking about sewering the lower portion, the, the peninsula portion. Green <coughs> Pond next to it on the west side. So it's Green Pond on the Acapescat side. Yes. Bourne's Pond, we are hoping that with the inlet widening and uh, IAs uh, that we will not need to sewer. Uh, and then Wakwoit Bay, you have Seaco Shores. Uh, it's very complicated geology and hydrology. Um, and we share this watershed with Mashpee and actually a portion of Sandwich as well. Uh, so that will require an intermunicipal agreement, which is beginning to move its way through uh, the selectmen. Um, it's, it's, at least it's on their radar screen. Um, and that, that will require negotiation with the other towns before we can actually move ahead on that. So 
in terms of addressing the nitrogen and carrying out the, the mission of the Water Quality Committee, we have tried to sewer as little as possible, but we are saying that these five watersheds um, <coughs> need uh, some sewering. All right, next. That leaves nine watersheds that don't need any sewering. Um, all of the watersheds are important, but these nine, uh, if we don't make the matter worse, uh, we can probably meet the TMDL by using aquaculture, IAs, maybe inlet widening in various, in various places. Um, so so that, that is cost effective for the town. Sewering is incredibly expensive, uh, both to construct and to maintain. Uh, it locks the town into high energy costs forever. Once you start pumping the water, you've got to keep pumping the water. Um, so it, there's a great deal the town can gain if we can avoid sewering uh, these other estuaries. Next. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll go back to that one. Mm -hmm. so, so basically, we're saying that the Conservation Commission sees the properties that are in the most sensitive areas, <coughs> the ones that are closest <coughs> to the water. And we'd like you to consider uh, as you review them, I mean, they may be there for, for a garage or, or uh, you know, add a deck, but that, that the environmental impact of that parcel be looked at and that you work, uh, that, that hopefully the applicant and the applicant's engineer would look at what is their nitrogen impact to the estuary that's near them. Uh, and with the help of the Board of Health, um, we're, we're hoping that we can move towards having uh, more nitrogen removal through the septic systems and less impact on these estuaries. That's it. Thank you, Virginia. Okay. Um, would you, would the Board of Health like to say something about the permitting the experience you've had, the process? I'd, I'd like to make a couple of general comments. Sure. The Virginia. Um, you know, one of the real challenges with these IAs and one of the things we found in West Falmouth is if we begin to do this in a systematic way, how do we manage them? Each one of them is a separate little treatment plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, they require a lot of oversight. And so if one of the situations we've been thinking about is Oyster Pond, where there are a couple of hundred houses, um, we could probably treat that entire watershed with IA system. But now all of a sudden you've got these 200 systems. Um, are you going to leave it? I mean, the state is going to say, if you're going to meet your TMDL, uh, we want to be assured that you're going to meet it. So uh, it doesn't seem to us that you can then let the homeowners individually be responsible for their IA systems. You're going to have to create <coughs> some sort of a management facility to do that. And we've been working on that uh, quite extensively. Um, but I think one of the things that we've learned from West Falmouth, that that's not a trivial thing, that uh, there have been some real management uh, issues just in dealing with those 20. So if we're as, as a town thinking, uh, you know, in a situation, you know, if we had in Little Pond with 1,500 houses decided we're going to treat those with IAs, we'd have a nightmare to deal with. And so we're going to need to really think very carefully how we, we do this and, and how we manage them. Um, we've sent a management scheme up to DEP. Mm -hmm. uh, they've casually looked at it. They haven't formally given us uh, a read on what they think. But it's, it's pretty clear that we will in town, either the Board of Health is going to have to manage that entity for each uh, area that we establish, or the Department of Public Works uh, is going to have to do it. And it, it will be a, a, a quite a chore to make that work. So I, I just want to make, uh, I understand mm -hmm. what we're all trying to achieve, mm -hmm. but even with this experimental program, nine of the 20 were, were uh, tight boxes or whatever right. you call Right, tight tanks. Right, which, which I mean, we're familiar with because we have to 
permit them. Right. And they all have to be basically seasonal right. houses. And um, you're not going to have that, those, no. in a lot of other situations. I, just, just like That's a John. very special situation. Right. Right. So I, I, guess, I guess I'd like to follow up on what you said as to um, nobody knows exactly what's going to happen in the future. But how soon do you think a, a more reasonable <coughs> IA that wouldn't require as much maintenance would come? I mean, presumably that's what you're talking about, John, right? You have to well, maintain there, things. There, there are two issues. Um, you know, one 50% one removal at 19 milligrams per liter doesn't get us there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just not worth pursuing and not worth putting in the ground at $25,000 a hit. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to get 75% removal, and there are systems now which are coming along that will do that. If we can make that layer cake work, which is a much more passive mm -hmm. system than things like the Hoot or the Eliminate, um, that will be a real boon to our, our problem. Um, we're not there yet. Um, you know, I don't think George has got the data set uh, yet. We don't know. So, for instance, what that's doing is it's basically taking a soil absorption system, mixing carbon in the form of cellulose into the sand under the system, and you get both nitrification and denitrification. What we don't know is how long those are going to last. Well, I was just going to say, um, might, might not that substrate be used up? Well, And then what do you have to do? I think there's reasonable <laughs> data from Nitrex systems where they've had the cellulose chips in a concrete box, that those have been going for quite a long time. So that cellulose breaks down very slowly, which is why it's so advantageous. It's a, it's, it's a time-release carbon source. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a reasonable chance that you might get 20 years out of a soil absorption system like that. But we certainly don't know that yet. I, I want to go to your question of, you know, how, how long do we think before we really have a solution here? Um, George is, Hoyfelder is very open about not ready for prime time yet. But I would think within two years we would have fairly reasonable data. And in those same two years we're going to be working on what we call the protocol, which is the management uh, piece that, that John referred to. Uh, this committee has spent quite a lot of time drafting it, and, and it is at DEP now for, for review. Um, so, so we're obviously not coming tonight with this is exactly what uh, we'd like you to do, um, or, or or what the town should do. But but I think it's time to have that conversation mm -hmm. um, because we are far enough along in our <coughs> study of all the 15 impaired estuaries to know that, that the general public needs to, to be aware you live in a really sensitive area in terms of the health of that estuary. And there will be times, like you had about six months ago when you had a, a house on Mashawina Street that was going to be torn down, they were going to put in an entirely new septic system, um, and, and so that, that turned out to be a win-win, uh, mm -hmm. and, and they used one of the, the drip dispersal, one of the, the more modern nitrogen renewables. So if at least there's that sort of box that gets checked off as, as the, the projects come across your desk, that's, that's the level of sensitization, sensitization that we're, we're pushing. I think one of the other things, one of the reasons we did the demonstration is because the standard was 19, so the industry designed to 19 milligrams per liter. When you create a, a better standard, so a standard that's more stringent, the industry then starts responding to a, a higher you know, standard of removal, and that's what we're starting to see. And so because we're able to offer um, vendors real installations where they can really sell their product, uh, we're finding you know, the list of, of potential technologies that, that can get us there, and we're starting to learn me mechanistically what it takes to keep those operating at those higher performance standards. And so, so we're seeing it. So in the next couple of years as well, mm -hmm. we're going to have in the ground, real world, you know, seasonal, highly variable data from real applications to see um, how how well we do do right. for some of these more promising mm -hmm. technologies. 
Um, how much experience is there maybe in other communities in the state or other states where they've established higher standards that not wear it? Wear it, yeah. Okay, I was afraid you would. Welcome to Valma, where we start. <laughs> Steve. Um, I, I don't want to get us down into the weeds or details, but I also want to make sure that no one thinks that the IAs are 10% of the cost of sewers, or even half. It's very close. In the case of the engineering study that was done for us by very good outside engineers for Oyster Pond, extremely close. I don't have the numbers on the top of my head, but it's not like you're cutting your costs by half. Mm -hmm. I, and I think, I think it's also worth remembering that there is an economy of scale. And even if the prices are, are similar, uh, with a big plant like we have in West Falmouth, if all of a sudden the EPA comes to us and says, well, we've changed the standard. You're now going to have to get rid of these contaminants of emerging concern. Now we've got one big plant which we can modify and we can, and we can get it. Uh, if we have 1,500 IAs all over town, uh, we're, we're, we're not going to get there. And mm -hmm. so I think the town should not be afraid of sewering where it looks like it's the best solution. If we look at Little Pond, the Little Pond betterment was $13,000. <laughs> you just saw the prices that we put up on the board for the IA systems. They're basically twice that. So, uh, and that's not to say that every sewering situation is going to have a betterment of $13,000. The betterment in North Falmouth for a little so the New Silver Beach was considerably higher than that. 28000 So yeah. comparable mm -hmm. to the I-8. So it's, it, that's going to vary. But it's something we need to keep an open mind about. I think, too, the, the got to know that the homeowner has that responsibility for the maintenance contract which we went through a whole process, kind of a little, little bit of a nightmare for us trying to get enforcement of that and ended up having to give them tickets mm -hmm. to be able to get these homeowners to get that contract in place. Again, not collecting the data because there's no contract, so there's nobody maintaining, so, you know, that whole um, little rigmarole. And I think we... We've relied on it, the county to keep track of the IA systems which we've installed so far in town. Yeah. So those get reported to the county and we had a, a very high rate of non-compliance. In other words, when we issue a permit for an IA system, it has to have a maintenance contract in perpetuity. Uh, but people get them and, and they cost a fair amount of money to keep and they just say after three or four or five years, well, maybe I don't need to do this, or the house gets sold and the new homeowner. And so we last year spent quite a bit of time chasing down these delinquent uh, accounts. Uh, and it was, it was a, a burden. And what happens when you chase them down? Well, you, we, they either comply or we take them to court. Uh -huh. that, so that's where the tickets process. came in, was a, you know, a whole nother um, individual <coughs> tickets daily <coughs> until they got in compliance. I mean, there was, was quite a process to it, um, looking toward that enforcement. Letters, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark? Yeah, I've got a couple comments. First of all, you mentioned there are 1,500 properties in Little Pond, and had they been <coughs> IA, it would have cost about $40 million at 26 k a piece. And I don't recall quite what the sewering cost, but it was in that ballpark. But the thing is, the IAs might get 12, maybe 19. The sewering is probably We're getting three. three. It's a whole lot better mm -hmm. for the same money. And the one thing I am sort of upset about is people coming to us, you guys came to us, with a one-of-the-time one IA system to trying to solve the nitrogen problem. That is a terrible onus on an individual homeowner who makes the mistake of deciding to either upgrade his house or somehow has to put a new septic in, and we get one fix out of how many do we need to make that work. Well, we don't know because the modeling is not very good anyway, but say we need a dozen or two dozen. I think it's doing it piecewise like that is, is not to our advantage as a town or certainly to homeowners. 
one of the other issues which I think we need to think about carefully, in New Silver Beach, when we established that sewer service area, and we had systems that were an absolute failure and were public health problems there. Um, and what we said was, we know that you're going to have a sewer in a couple of years. Um, we're going to just carry you along until we get that sewer put in. So if we now decide there are four or five areas in town that we know we're going to have to sewer, it is not to our benefit to ask someone on that waterfront now to put in an IA system when we know in five years or ten years we're going to sewer it. Sure. Because we're, that's a vote we're not going to get when we ask people uh, at the ballot to, mm -hmm. to pay for a sewer because they said, I've already paid for it once. Mm -hmm. So we need to think critically about where we're dropping IAs in uh, as we make our planning. And that's why we have the two maps, the maps of the estuaries that we can, uh, that can be um, addressed with sewering and that list that we can without. I mean, that's the whole point of that exercise was to parse that right away so we have a sense of where um, solutions could be not, not sewering. Sir, um, we'd like to hear from you. I should have said at the beginning, for the members of the public, we um, need to ask you to come to the podium there, be, mainly because um, you have to use a microphone for the benefit of the TV audience. And please begin by telling us who you are. All right, I'm Bill Kerfoot. I'm on the, I don't know if this is on, but I'm on the uh, Board of Trustees of Oyster Pond Environmental Trust. Uh, and as a, uh, we appreciate work that John has been doing in the Board of Health to try and move forward with the IAs. We particularly appreciate the committee's work at the present time. But you should be aware of the counterpoint to this, that for over 10 years now, we have been approaching individual homes as they come in on Oyster Pond, asking them to put in denitrification systems. Our president put in his own, and he, by the way, is now at six PPM. He has a ruck system, but he's at six PPM and less. So he's meeting that eight requirement that John has talked about in the past he'd like to see. Um, we've run into a problem, though, during the last five years, and that is that um, the people involved who wanted to put in denitrification systems, and actually my wife, Pat, and I fit in that category right now, um, we asked for consideration for putting in a denitrification, and we were told, well, it's all up to you at the present time, because if we sewer you, we're just going to hook up directly to your home and you're going to lose the value of the new system that you're putting in at the present time. The net result has been there have been 10 homes in the last five years that really would have gone forward with putting in an IA and a denitrification system that have said, I don't know with that situation uh, if I should really go forward with the denitrification. So what we have asked, John has heard before, you guys have heard it before. We have asked, okay, on Oyster Pond, please make some consideration of that because the longer you wait at the present time, you just end up having more cost for the homeowners. The average cost of a home on Oyster Pond is 1.5 million. The amount for a septic system cost is considered by most to be a small cost. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. Kerfoot. Yeah. Mr. Kerfoot, who told you that? Yeah. You said we were told, but by what? By the which town agency? Um, well, that's a fair co question on that. Um, we actually, uh, no, I was at a meeting uh, associated with the board and in discussing with one of our representatives, that's Steve, over there relative to this and he is correct so i checked on it he said you cannot at the present time assume that you if you put in a denitrification that you will not have to sacrifice that on a hookup to a sewer system and as far as i'm concerned 
at the present time <coughs> around the pond area, if we consider that, sewer hookups become automatic. You don't have a provision right in place. I would like to hear that if there's a provision right now that would allow us to go to the people who wish to install and tell them that, no, you could go ahead and just use your system the IA has installed. Um, Ron. Oh, thank you. Uh, just, just a couple of comments. Um, on the, uh, start with cost, coming back to cost a little bit again. Uh, one thing is that um, I think in Orleans they just calculated the cost per house would be like $70,000 per sewering. Okay, and they're a little bit, it's a bit of a problem there. So, but even for in Falmouth here, we, when we did the Bourne's Pond Inlet Widening Study, the estimated sewer cost there was 47000 which is about double what the Little Pond. Now, Little Pond was kind of a gift in a way at half the cost because of the density and the fact that we could have relatively easy access to hook up mm -hmm. to go to the, to the, the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and as well as um, the capacity to be to deal with it there, okay, for, for the most part. Other places we may need to do, we're looking at ocean outfall, you, as you read the paper in, these, in our meetings, or looking at going to Joint Base Cape Cod as for, for treatment. So, um, so these, these costs are up there, relatively speaking. Um, and, that, uh, and even with the Little Pond system, Site 7, which is the new discharge site, wasn't included in the in the cost of the sewer, the betterment. That was a separate, uh, about $4 million, I think, for Geneva, right? Yeah. But it was basically an additional thing that town covered as, as a cost. So these are, as Virginia said, it's expensive and it's forever, in a way. It's a lot of pumping, a lot of energy. It doesn't, which goes a little bit against the, the town's uh, climate uh, protection action plan, okay? Increasing energy use. And, and it is uh, a big deal uh, in terms of the, the town use of electricity. Um, coming back to, to what John was saying too as well about the 200 units being managed. Well, I had a conversation with Dudley Moore at DEP, well, it must be over a year ago, about that, about a project around Oyster Pond. And he said, in his view, from the state standpoint at that moment, which was just a view of his view, was that probably the town would have to take responsibility for management. The DPW basically would have to, even though they're individual and maybe there'd be uh, certain agreements about what needed to be done, but the, they would probably want to see the town being responsible about the, to meet the TMDL, the nitrogen TMDL issue. So those are um, some of the points. Um, and then in thinking about, um, this is slightly an aside, but coming back to your to the conservation commission and um, and your basic mandate is the hundred foot distance from the shore of mm -hmm. all water bodies in town right and now we're talking and about other resources yeah right water resources of all types so and we're looking at in West Owens Harbor Virginia talked about 300 feet is what 170 houses in that range and then but it really needs to be 600 feet so, but actually it needs to be the whole, all those, those watershed things sure are, are all part of it. So, it, you know, in terms of, of a responsibility or even maybe a special legislation, I mean, in a way, somebody needs to be, or some agency needs to be really, uh, I guess the state in a way controls things, but whether there's a local way of intervening in, in development and, and things to get, a town assessment done in this broader picture of really where the impacts are. And um, uh, Betsy and I had talked about the a year a few years ago. Remember me, Betsy? Uh, yeah, we met. Yeah, we met at a coffee and we talked you about. Talk um, about <laughs> <laughs> it was a while ago. I can't remember. But we, we about effluents affecting like. Uh, um, uh, a Crocker Pond in West Falmouth and, and as well as with the SFA because the discharges don't stop. Don't, you know, because even though the discharge is more than 100 feet away from the shore or whatever for rapid infiltration from the plants, it's just thinking about how, what agency in town, what is really the, that, that would need to look into those kinds of things. It's just a, just a thought to put out there. And I don't know um, 
uh, it seemed to me that we don't really have anybody in town. We don't have an entity in town to, to, to look at that. Betsy, so. I want to go back to these costs, too. Yeah, right. Back to, I was going to ask you, Steve. I didn't quite understand what you're saying, but then uh -huh. in, the, in the leading comp. So you're saying it's about equal. It depends on the location. It exactly. really depends <coughs> on the water. No, no, on I understand. And IAs, just like, uh, well, in a different way, that IAs depend on location. For instance, if the lot sizes are too small, you can't put in any leaching field. Right. But John's the expert on that. Right. Well, we know that, too. Right. <laughs> and uh, Oyster Pond has the benefit of being close to the force main that serves Woods Hole. OK, but here, I so I have a couple of points couple of things I want to kind of throw out there. One is, what about the plan Bill was just talking about? When you have, when we had gas put up our street, we all, 12 of us had to, you know, 12 of the 20 had to agree to have it, and then they'd give it to us for a, a big discount as to put the pipe up. But I was the only one that connected to the pipe right away. So what about allowing our sewer bylaw, as it is written at the moment, says that if a main goes in front of your house, you shall hook up within 90 days. Right. But what I'm saying is that could change. Right? No, no. Uh, actually, it, that mimics state law. Um, so that would not change. If, what, if the sewer goes by, you have to hook in. You do. Absolutely. <coughs> Even if you could change the law, you would change it to a state of extreme complication. I mean, you tell me then how you start figuring out the costs. Uh, and, and so just to follow on that, so the betterment laws are also state laws. And so once you make a decision to sewer a certain area, town meeting every, every, votes that area, follows the lot line, and then if, if you're, you're, in, in, it, you if you're in, you're in. You have to pay the betterment, gets put a lien on your property, um, and you have to hook up. Okay, so, my, so the other question is, I know if you're on the sewer, you have to pay sewer fees, right? Everybody has to pay sooner or later to yes. do something with wastewater. Mm -hmm. Right. What about these IA systems? How, you know, they, they would have a similar charge. Now, if we set up a management entity, and in the model that we've been working on, um, there would be a set charge that would cover maintenance, inspections, uh, and a variety of other things. But so somebody has to they wouldn't track get. Somebody they wouldn't. That. There's going to have to be a town entity okay. that it's runs cost money. each one of the uh, absolutely that runs each one of those entities. Now you may be able to subcontract part of that to the county or to another entity, but essentially someone on an IA system is going to be paying the <coughs> equivalent of what someone on the sewer is paying as a sewer charge. In other words, there will be an annual charge if you have an IA uh, in one of these districts that will cover the, the variety of costs that the town incurs to manage them. Right. Okay. So, so your strategy right now is to pick four or five areas that you know have to be sewered. I mean, that's what you started off with, and saying the areas that are outside those areas you know have to be sewered, maybe we should think about IA. Well, we, we yes. I, I, the short answer is, would, would be yes. Um, and when we get later on in the agenda, we're going to talk about the comprehensive wastewater management plan for <coughs> th that we're now, the town is working on. But there are actually two, because there's a second, second process, second uh, comprehensive wastewater management plan that is being worked through for specifically the oyster pond watershed. Um, so so <coughs> it, it, all of this eventually <coughs> fits together, but it, it, right now there's several things running on parallel paths. I think it would be. Let me just ask one more question while, while people are still looking at me. There, there would, um, these additional areas that would have to be sewered, that can't all be handled at West Falmouth, can it? There would have to be a new plan. Well, no, no, actually. Well, I mean, I'm asking. Yes, I, I, and, and I believe at this point the answer is that it could be managed at West Falmouth. When we get to that agenda item, we'll go into it in more detail, if that's certainly. okay. The plan certainly has capacity. Yeah, the plan, the plan can be up to 2 million gallons. Okay. I'd just like to say, I think we should think really hard about the question of, of longevity 
and the long, a little bit looking long term on this question because, um, you know, essentially if you if you sewer an area, you have fixed your problem, essentially permanently, right? Um, if you put in an IA system, we don't have very much data yet on how long they're going to perform at what level. Um, <clears throat> typically, a sewer, I mean, a septic system lasts for. I don't know, a certain number of decades, and then you have to replace it, right? So then we've, if we replace them all, then we've, it's essentially equivalent to paying for sewering twice, right, at that point. Um, and then we also, when we're thinking about these low-lying coastal areas, we have to think about sea level rise as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so the separation distance between the land surface and the aquifer is going to get smaller over time, mm -hmm. and the frequency with which yards with septic systems are going to get flooded is going to increase. Um, so we have to think about what the, the response of the, the performance of the septic system is going to be under those changing conditions as well. Just a quick point on the permanent sewer thing. The state's guideline is that there's an economic useful life of 30 years from sewer. Okay. That doesn't mean it goes, all goes away, but it means yeah. that things start breaking down, things start happening. And if they're low and pressure costs. systems. So, so it depends right. then that if you look at the IA system, if they go in and they're good for 20, 25 years, yeah. then you've got your <coughs> benefit okay, from that. And then if the sewer is necessary, which we hope it isn't, but in many cases, but yeah, but I think if we if we go down the road of saying this area we're not going to sewer, we're going to do IA in this area, that area is never going to be sewered. We've already made that decision. No matter how this the system perform in the future, um, how frequently you have to re um, uh, replace them, anything like that, if, there's no way the public is going to vote to say, okay, I've put in my a IA system and now I'm going to pay to, to hook up to the sewer. So I think um, I think if you do the calculation out more than the next 15 or even 30 years, I think from what I've seen so far and what I've heard tonight, um, I just tend to think the sewering is going to be the better option in just about every way. And you know we've seen the data from from the IA system so far, several dozen systems, a lot of data uh, from the county. And you have your 19 milligrams per liter on this graph. There's a bell curve around the 19 milligrams per liter stretching out to 60 or 70 milligrams per liter with a, de uh, with a tail, right? So it doesn't really seem like it's, it's getting us there. I'm, I'm kind of skeptical that in two years that uh, that curve is going to is going to be able to bring us down to, you know, 10 milligrams per liter or something like that. And one other thing, um, so as it is right now, people have to have a maintenance contract with a certain amount of uh, sampling frequency with the data. But if they don't pass, there are no consequences for that. So if we say we're going to manage the system, the problem with IA systems, does that mean that we're going to have consequences for people who have systems that don't meet mm -hmm. and then <clears throat> who's responsible for somehow making that system meet performance and one other one other point John mentioned before we need we need 90% removal for it to be effective but we also need 90% removal 90% of the time and the, these seem these systems seem to perform at highly variable levels we had someone uh, come to us, to the Board of Health, um, with a system that, <clears throat> that was performing poorly, and the, the management company representative came and told us, well, it's because they've been using cleaning products frequently. Well, are we going to tell people you can't use cleaning products <laughs> or your system's not going to work? So, so we're going to, do we have enough data to know which system is going to work at a 90% level and all the time, even if people put things down their, their, their drain that will affect performance. Well, they shouldn't be putting it down the drain. That's why we have household hazardous waste collections no, that, I, no, that no, are he free. No, 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 he was talking about bleach. Yeah. yeah. He was talking about bleach. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. Oh. Laundry, yeah. anything. I mean, using bleach. I don't know if it was true what he said, but mm. that was his explanation. Right. Um, well, I just want to. I think it's really important to understand that when the Water Quality Management Committee plans, we plan estuary by estuary, 
Yep. And there are vastly different kilogram removal targets. A place like Quisset needs mm -hmm. 300 kilograms. A place like Little Pond needs 5,000 kilograms. Right. And so the idea that you can strategically use what we call a mix of alternatives, IAs are part of it, shellfish, permeable reactive barriers, the non-structural solutions fit in the context of a particular estuary. So it's not like we're saying either we're <coughs> going to put IAs in or we're going to put sewers in. That's, that's not how this is. Understood, that's but it's a doing. particular area you're making a decision, somebody's going to make a decision that a particular area is not going to be sewered. And my, right. my point is that's forever. It's not going to be, or for a long time, it's not going to be sewered once that decision is made. Right. And the planning process is to identify how the mix of alternatives and backup plans work mm -hmm. to ensure that the nitrogen removal targets um, will, will work as well. And I think the other piece of it is we also, as a town and as committees, need to be aware of the inevitable consequences of sewering on density of development, on water use, on energy use, and on a host of other um, uh, environmental factors. Our town will change if the whole town is sewered environmentally. The, the water may have less nitrogen in it, but we may find a host of other environmental concerns that we've created because of the density that sewering allows. And so I think we need to have those real issues, and we're seeing them in Little Pond today. These are not theoretical. This could possibly happen. We wrote a flow neutral bylaw, and we are having vast increases in flow and development because we've sewered an area. We should be explicit as in a planning way about we want to see that kind of increase in density of development. Because just because you've removed the nitrogen from the watershed doesn't mean you've fixed the environment because our built environment is, is bigger than just the water. So I, I think it's really important that we don't um, try to solve one problem and create a bunch of other ones in, so in the, our planning. The increase in flow, what, what, what's causing an increase in flow? You're talking about an increase in density? Well, it turns out if you have a vacant parcel, uh, if you have a bunch of vacant parcels, you can totally redraw the lines and bring in a 40B. And so instead of seven houses, we're going to have 28 houses. Mm. That's one example. So every single empty lot in the Seward area, and fortunately there are very few, um, could, could have duplexes, quadruplexes, uh, where originally it was going to be a single house. Um, uh -huh. Secondly, uh, you're having redevelopment of parcels. So what was a, a low flow business, now you can bring in a business that uses lots of water. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, so we're <laughs> the, the, D, the DPW has started a spreadsheet because of all these extra flows that, you know, they were just counting when they made the calculation one house, one house, one business. Um, and, and so the, the, there definitely is an intensity of development. Uh, we're also having redevelopment on Main Street. Uh, so you have stores on the first floor, a whole new second floor is going to be put on. It's going to be all apartments. Um, so so there, there, are, there are consequences to that. But, but I thought there's, there's one other consequence. Yeah? Those are all planning. Yes. I oh, I to do with this planning. Right. I understand. There's we, a lot of positive thing about yep. having retail on the bottom and yep. apartments on the top. Yeah, that's Completely something that was, being, that was being promoted by yeah. some of the yeah. boards, that's right? Good. But yeah. the point that Sia was making was that sewers do have an impact, and it does. No, and, but and it does, does, here's a question, though. If you Kevin, just, Kevin, let me, right, fi let me right. finish mine. Okay. So you've, you have more nitrogen than you originally planned. And you need to take it to the plant. Uh, so you now have a plant that has capacity, but it is being used up by these, these, new, these new developments. So you get to the other parts of town that still need to be sewered. We just need to think of the various impacts okay, of that. Okay, so, so on, the, on the increased density question, does that mean that we actually, the town grew as a result of this? More people moved to Falmouth? because that area was sewered? It, or is it just people moved around within Falmouth and were still the same size? And so the point is, if you sewer the whole town, that doesn't necessarily mean that you know, a million people are going to want to move here. Oh, yes, it will. Oh, yes, it will. I don't know. I don't know. Are, so wait, are you, so 
<laughs> so what, but why? Why would they want to move? Because if you have more residential development, more people will move here. And, and at some level, the whole conversation, I mean, this is, I feel like this is a little bit beyond the scope of the agenda in terms of the conversation. But I, I think you have to be very aware that if you're building more and more houses, more and more people are going to live here. We're not just going to move around. So accessory apartment bylaw is just going to, we're just going to have a million people move here when we do that? So if we have affordable housing, we have too many people? Is that? No. I didn't say too. I, but we have traffic, and we will have more traffic. Whether we decide that that's a good thing or not should be a decision. We shouldn't just say, we're going to solve, we're going to solve the nitrogen problem with Agreed. soaring Agreed. and yeah. not be incredibly explicit about do we want to allow buildings to go to 40 feet, 45 feet, and put a fourth story on them? Because now we can, because the sewer, the septic system is not limiting the water use. Agreed, but th those are all, yeah, those are all additional questions. But I don't think it's necessarily a foregone con conclusion that if you sewer a town, that town is going to explode in, in uh, I think population. I think it absolutely is. It will become like there's Long no Island. Question, there's no question. And the whole reason the state required as part, part of the um, O'Leary bill, a flow neutral bylaw, is because the experience over and over and over and over with sewering is when you sewer, towns explode. <coughs> that is exactly why the O'Leary bill required sewering for nitrogen purposes to have a flow neutral bylaw to, to stop to, to control against that um, in an unplanned way okay so there are other way, ways to deal with that potential side effect but you have correct to, but you have to deal with it agreed but those don't necessarily mean therefore we should not sewer we should use ia systems instead and it may right? be that the solutions are not 100 percent effective so maybe you know, in the same way the IA is 100% effective, the flow note to bylaw isn't either. Kevin, you wanted to say something. Yeah, uh, I'd just like to comment that we're discussing something that we shouldn't be discussing. This has got nothing to do with flow in, in terms of flow of sewerage. Mm -hmm. It's got nothing to do with energy use because you can always make an AR as we speak, making great strides and making uh, the uh, operations of pumping stations and uh, treatment plants more efficient. Uh, but you're talking about something that the planning board or somebody else, a zoning board, should have. And, and as a veteran of a small town, that had the same uh, population for about 30 or 40 years, and then we were sewered, and then suddenly we discovered that there were all of these paper streets that were there, mm -hmm. okay? What I would advise is that some responsible group do some planning on that, but it's got nothing at all to do with whether you sewer the remaining portion or whether you have people use this other system. Mm -hmm. And I'll shut up at that point, because um, I'd have to admit how I know so much about it. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to point out one other thing, and I've said this, and it's not that I don't appreciate all the work that you've done, but your alternative systems also have an effect on the environment sometimes more of an effect, sometimes less. I know Steve and Ron we were, and John, I think you were at that meeting, and you know, using your freshwater systems to provide sewage, you know, nitrogen removal so that it doesn't get to the estuaries so you meet your TMDL, that's not really acceptable for the town. You know, you have to think of your, your um, wetland system as a whole and well and I, so you're looking like I don't know what you're talking about so I'm going to give you a specific <laughs> and that, is, that, that was a specific technology it, it turns out that even if you weren't opposed to it it wouldn't have worked 
<laughs> so, so oh, I knew, I knew I wasn't convincing you in that meeting. Okay, all right. So, but, but, no, but, so, but that was one. I mean, and I understand. But we're not, no one is proposing that the, particular system. I, I know, but, and I understand why you were passionate about it, but you understood why I was passionate That's right. on the other side. That's right. So, so, so okay. 500 years ago, we should have lynched Sir Jonathan Crapper. When he, when he decided that we get rid of our wastewater with fresh water with that's water. drinkable. Yeah. Exactly. It was absolutely yeah. insane system. It's all system. the same. Drinking water is going to cost us money. Getting rid of wastewater is going to cost us money. Everybody has to realize there's no free lunch here. Yeah. Janet, would you please go to the podium because I don't think the TV folks will oh, be able okay. to hear you without a microphone. I just have a question regarding. Oh, okay. Oh, I just have a question regarding, and I could be wrong, but I seem to remember when New Silver, the wastewater treatment plant in New Silver, was put in, they did limit the number of bedrooms that could be um, could be added to that service area. So the town could, looking ahead. And as Kevin said, uh, and, or somebody said, an entity could be created. If you were to sewer an area, it doesn't automatically mean that there, there would be an explosion in growth. It was managed in New Silver. Um, it could be managed in other areas of town. That would be my only we, question. We had slash a, a fairly restrictive mm -hmm. neutral yeah. flow neutral bylaw mm -hmm. for New Silver Beach. They they were grandfathered what they had, and. Uh, they could then add up to, th to a total of three bedrooms. So we had a three bedroom max if there were a two bedroom cottage. Now that, that community was very p particular in the sense that they were in such tough shape that they were taking their laundry back to Boston every week to do it. Because when they did a load of laundry, it came up in came their up. neighbor's yard. And, and so th we have seen uh, some redevelopment in New Silver Beach, but, you know, given a, a, a reasonable f neutral bylaw uh, like that, I think, and, and I, you know, uh, clearly one of the issues with thinking about this is there's a real planning component. Mm -hmm. And yes. if yeah, we want to no keep one. the character of the town mm -hmm. a certain way, we need to think this process through to build out. Um, mm -hmm. what, are, what are the consequences of how we deal with this? So we'll have to have the planning board join us next time and have a very long meeting. <laughs> Diane. Um, and just um, from a, I guess my, my simple nurse um, head, I look at even our weather upcoming this weekend and I say to myself, okay, so we've got coastal flooding. So what's happening to all of those properties that have, whether it's an IA system or a basic Title V system that's down by the water? I mean, they're getting going to get flooded, and I don't know if it'll really happen this time, but what we've seen with the f flooding. So if we looked at our environment, the, the things that we struggle with as a board is when we get um, requests for, whether it's a Title V or an I, we've got to look at the, the lot and the size of the lot. So whether it's a regular Title V system or if it's an IA system, you still have to fit it on that lot. The areas that we're talking about that they seem to me, they're postage size lots that we're discussing. And that's where all along our, our shores and that's, they're all small lots. Way up in West Falmouth, you've got some more room that you can do some of that. But when you get into that Mara Vista area and the Heights, I mean, we're struggle with some of the ones that come to us with the Heights. How are we going? How can they get this on there? And so it requires then variances. So then you say, okay, again, the simple mind says, okay, they're going to have this on there, and it's not meeting all the setbacks, and we're going to have to grant them variances because mm -hmm. they're doing the best they can with what they have. Mm -hmm. And then we're getting a big flood. Where is the flood going to be? It's all along those coastal areas. So I think as far as that, it's true. I think you, you look at once you make that decision, and maybe it needs a big plan to say, these are areas that it would make a lot of sense to put some IA systems and know that we've got some wiggle room if things don't work well versus some of these other areas that are already tight to start with that no matter what you put in there, it's not going to be the greatest for the environment. The best way to go would be sewer. So it takes that big planning. And we did that. We did a lot area map. And I think mm -hmm. we've shown it at the Board of Selectmen and other places where that was our actual first cut. We said lots, you know, between 
you know, under 7,000 square feet lots between 7 and, and 10, and then between 10 and 15. And that's basically how we filtered out those areas that clearly right. need sewer because they're not big enough. Yeah. And Seacoast exactly Shores, I mean, look at the lots down exercise. there. They're so tiny. That's right. yeah. I mean, if you're going to put sewer, it's a, that to me, that would make the most sense. You're along the shore and you've got yeah. tiny lots. You put and those two things map. together, we, we did that priority. Exercise. That's exactly how we did it. All right. Shall we move ahead? Let's move anybody? ahead. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> um, talk about other developments um, on the agenda of the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan. And thank you. Virginia, would you like to start this off? Sure. Um, the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan is actually a very big, very big document and a very long planning process. It's actually 40 years. Is, uh, and what you're looking at uh, up here that's colored in, everything, all those watersheds, so it's all the South Coast watersheds plus West Island Harbor are all part of this uh, legal process called Comprehensive Wastewater Management <coughs> that the town is involved in. Uh, and so what, you're, what I'm passing out um, is actually a timeline starting with the first filing uh, that the town made of the environmental notification form in 2002. Uh, and what we've done so far, and then I want to focus on what's going to happen in the next uh, four or five years. Thank you. Um, so uh, the committee is concerned about all 15 estuaries, and that's the map that I showed you on the previous presentation. This is as I said, the legal process specifically um, through the Massachusetts Environmental Protection Act that we are following. Uh, and it sets a total maximum daily load, TMDL, for each of those affected estuaries. And then it says to the town, how are you going to meet that TMDL? Um, so I, for the folks at home, I did uh, take this uh, and change it into slides, so I'm just doing that to, so that folks at home can, can see something. Um, but I'm basically going to race through these early dates um, of the town beginning to do a study called the needs analysis and then an alternative analysis. And then in 2010, uh, there was a draft produced by an engineering company that was brought to the selectmen to vote, and the, the price tag was $600 million, so we just knew it was not going to work. Um, so what happened instead was the town meeting created this committee as a permanent standing committee, funded us uh, to investigate alternatives to sewers where it made sense, and to proceed with the first watershed that was the worst watershed, and that was the Little Ponds uh, watershed. Um, the Little Pond watershed was also phase two of the sewer that went in in the 1980s that did Woods Hole and Main Street. And that's partly why the Little Pond sewer system did not cost as much as you might expect, because the pumping stations and the force mains had been sized to include that at some later date. Um, the process we then went through, create you have to do a draft, you submit it to the state, you wait for the state to approve it, that determine that we comply with the law with FEBA. That was in 2012. Uh, then you do a final plan, which is specific. That has engineering plans. It says this is where the pump station will be, uh, force mains, and if you can, for the people at home. Um, and then you wait for the secretary to say, yes, your final plan does comply. Um, and we also have a Cape Cod Commission process that we're going through in parallel, and they have to approve um, what, what we're doing. And then you come to town meeting uh, and then a ballot vote to bond uh, to construct the little pond. And as, as we all know, the total little pond um, project cost about $40 million, and we had about 1,500 properties that were involved. Um, the Department of Environmental Protection has an additional step, which they call the targeted watershed management plan. And that is the very specific plan for the very specific watershed that you're working on. And the only reason I'm going through all this dry stuff 
is that as we look at the next watershed, which is now under discussion, and that's Great Pond, we will have to go through these same steps again. The state wanted the town to give a plan for all of the estuaries, and we said, we can't fund that, we can't think it through, uh, there are too many decisions that have to be made. So they said, okay, you can take, do a little pond, and you can take five years to explore the alternatives and decide which, which your next steps are. And so I'm going to come back to that uh, in a minute. I'm going to say at this same time that the approval of the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan in 2014 also included a project with Bourne's Pond. Uh, and so that has been following its own regulatory permitting process. Uh, it required a secretary's certificate uh, with the specific design plans as to what the town intended to do. And then, as you know, it required a hearing before you. Uh, that was appealed and then uh, required review by the state and that superseding order has come back. And we are in the process now of doing the other pieces because we have to have a Corps of Engineers permit. And the Corps pulls together coastal zone management and marine fisheries and all of those, all of those other pieces. So that, that is um, moving ahead. Um, it's been slow, but it's moving ahead. Um, and so that's where we are at the moment in terms of what this committee has done uh, and the permitting processes we're going through. Now, we have an important deadline that is coming up, and that is December 2019. Uh, the state gave us this five years to explore all kinds of alternatives and to implement the Little Pond uh, sewer system, and they now want a report on what do you think, what have you done, where do you think you're going? <laughs> um, Falmouth has always said we're serious about these, and these um, estuaries, um, but we have to figure out a way to fund it because the cost is so huge. Uh, and so what we've done is identified the times as we look forward out to 40, 2040, um, when are we retiring old debt, paid off a school, paid off a fire station, um, and we could issue new debt in the same amount. So the next funding window is April 2025. Uh, and so as we talk now and in these next years, we need to be thinking about what's the next piece of sewering, Where's, uh, where is it the money best spent, and to have all of the decisions and permits in place so that we can come to town meeting in 2025. Uh, to ask for um, the, the town meeting's approval and then the voters' approval. So that's what these future milestones are. There are two more debt drop-off windows, one in 2030, and then I ran out of space at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so there's another one in 2035. Um, <clears throat> and that gets us basically to the, the planning window that uh, we currently are working with. So that's my update on the Comprehensive Wave Water Management Plan. I didn't know what else you wanted to know, so um, this is a start. Yeah, that's, a, that's kind of just what, okay. where things stand and what you anticipate yeah. focusing on next. Okay. We will have a very public process as we prepare this update. Um, this year is still data collection and, and organization, but 2019, uh, the committee will have public discussions of what's going into the document. The selectmen will be doing the same, and ultimately the selectmen have to vote the document and send it to the state by that deadline of December 19th. Betsy. So from what you're saying, the next window is 2025, right. and that maybe, probably will be great, the Great Pond. A portion of Great Pond watershed. Which means, so this gets back to your question. Mm -hmm. So if we were to put IA systems at Oyster Pond, there's no way we're going to get to Oyster Pond sewering for 20 years, 20 or 30 years. Okay. Um, Is that I, correct? Unless somehow well, we would several not, hundred million dollars gets dumped onto Falmouth to <laughs> solve this problem? We would not put IAs into the Great Pond watershed. No, no, no. Okay. But I'm He's saying talking about oyster oyster. you're talking about oyster. The, the, the oyster about pond project would be very small compared to the possibly be. 
It's 200 miles. Oh, but you're, near, you're, you're already near another that's sewer. Right. You're near right. another right. sewer main. I see. That's your catch point, point has too. A lot. It's, it's every, at the base of the pond. Yeah. yeah. Every estuary is different. Right. 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 But what I'm, but so Kevin was saying, why would you want to spend this much money when you were going to have to hook up to the sewer? But some of these places aren't going to be hooked up to the sewer for mm -hmm. right. 20, 30, 40, 50, 50 years, yes. even ones that should be hooked up to that the sewer. That is correct. That's a very good yes. point. So that's right. Oyster Pond, however, that, that decision. That, right. I realize that that's sufficiently okay. small. Yeah. It's small, it's and you're already near the sewer. <coughs> Hook up, but some of these others aren't necessarily. There's a lot of infrastructure that has to be put in right. before that be. There's exactly. also there's also some discussion of betterments for IA. And I let's please not get into that. No. Okay, <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to get into that. Not tonight. But, not but tonight. If, if that happened, it would be need the bond as just as much as the sewers. Sure. I would think. Because the town would be contributing money. Let's not get so into we're it. Not, no. yeah, right. we're, not, we're not ready to discuss that part. Uh, lots, lots of details in the weeds there. Um, the main focus, to, so your committee knows, is update required by the state, December 2019. It will have a um, basically preliminary or conceptual, conceptual sewer service area for a portion of the Great Pond watershed. Ron. Yeah. Thanks. I just want to bring up others that we haven't talked about some of the other alternatives in much depth tonight. But just just <coughs> reflecting not so much on Belmont tomorrow, but at Mashpee. In Mashpee, they looked at their sewer needs and they came up with a a figure of about three hundred sixty million dollars to deal with the impacts, particularly around uh, Coit Bay and the estuaries associated. But then they added, then they looked into shellfish as a mitigation for a water quality management. And that reduced the cost to 220 million, or savings of 140 million dollars with the shellfish component. Now DEP has approved this approach. They don't necessarily sanction the result, okay, yet. But the but Mashpee will is proceeding along these lines, and these are conservative figures about the shellfish savings. But that um, that you know they'll see what happens. And if it works, it could be that there's much less sewer needed. And we in Balance are also pursuing uh, various options and looking into that. So there could be considerable potential for this. And, and I, you know, I've worked with aquaculture systems around the world, and sometimes you can actually overdo it and do too much removal of nutrients so that the, the wild production can be impacted. So it can be very powerful uh, means of, of helping to control water quality. So uh, Andrew Gottlieb was here um, uh, a couple weeks ago and gave a presentation and said that they're, they're very dedicated and committed to pursuing this. And they started with the shellfish. And they will see what they can do. And then they'll move from there. And it's revenue relatively neutral or so, or even positive in terms of the benefits from it. So we're, we haven't talked about shellfish tonight, but, mm -hmm. but that's another dimension to this. As Considering these timelines, you may be finding things uh, between now and some of these future dates. That we're and I think it's fair to say in all of the estuaries where we're not talking about sewer, and we are talking about shellfish as part of the solution, right. yeah. so very important piece of our plan, too. Courtney. So I want to bring this down to kind of base level. I've heard a lot of discussion. And um, so I'm going to pose the issue. It says here that uh, in your timeline in December 2019, we'll have a comprehensive plan. So I am an uh, update. An update. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm a citizen of Falmouth, and I'm faced with a failing septic system in an environmentally sensitive area. So you posed a number of questions. One of which is, if I spend thirty thousand dollars. To put in an I a, a you know a nitrogen uh, reduction system, um, and my, I want to know as a citizen at that point for sure. I just cut through the fog. I just want to know that if I'm going to make that investment, I'm not going to be told in five years by the town. Now you have to sewer. 
You're not the word, Courtney. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I don't. I'm saying I think we have to get to, I don't care. I want to reduce the uncertainty. Life is full of a lot of uncertainties. And when you're talking about $30,000, I'd like to know with some degree of certainty if I make that investment that I'm not going to be told five years from then, you have to sue her. And I don't understand why when you people are doing all your planning, you can't map it out so that the average citizen can walk into the Board of Health or whatever permitting authority and say, okay, I'm faced with an issue, what, do I, what are my choices? And know that for certainty. Well, you're just asking. Mm -hmm. We just went through this. Exercise. No, no, no. I I know Wait what you went through. Wait a second. I, yeah, I know what you went through. I'm looking at that. I'm a citizen right now. Well, that's going to I I've heard a lot of stuff, I and I'm boiling it down. I just want to know that I can go somewhere and know certain. It's not well, then, then it's, it, if it's not going to happen, I'm saying it should be one of your charges to make sure it happens. Um, from the standpoint of the. Conservation Commission, or at least some concerns that I have when certain projects come before us, um, there are, we don't have any requirements about denitrification systems. Uh, right. Um, and occasionally there is a project which, because of <coughs> where the property is located, right. what kind of resources are involved, and that sort of thing, um, there is discussion among us about whether or not to require them to put in a denitrifying <laughs> system. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a, I find it a difficult mm -hmm. thing to grapple with when we don't even have regulations about that, although we do have a general <laughs> mandate. Absolutely. You know, we can, um, I think, um, make a legitimate argument for requiring it sometimes. But to me, this whole uh, line of discussion is extremely important and very helpful just to get a sense of the time horizons we're talking about and the, the kinds of trade-offs um, involved. And so, Madam, Madam Chairman, so that's why we have this map. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we can say with pretty good certainty that these nine estuaries, we can figure out other ways to meet the TMDL. They're not on a plan to, uh, to be sewered. Uh, and I would say the, the flip side of that is the ones that we are recommending for sewering, that is a 40-year plan. And so it's going to take us time to work our way through that. So uh, even if we were wrong, uh, that this is 40 years, uh, well, another 25 years out. Um, and, and I could also point out that there's no reason that state regulations could not be modified going forward and existing systems that achieved certain standards and performed regularly for some length of time would be grandfathered in. I, I don't see that that would be very difficult to change in the state regulations as long as you had good operational standards that had to be met. But, you know, right. <laughs> politics is another whole part. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, this is a little different. I'm pivoting a little different. I'm going to go back over to health. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> So um, you, you were talking about how important it is to, if we, we, we do in certain situations encourage IA. And, and I understand your point, but there are places that nothing's going to happen for 20, 40, 60 years. So if we could reduce nitrogen, even if it's lot by lot, it's better than not doing it at all. Mm -hmm. But we still need to have some kind of control over it. And so now I'm going to shift from Courtney telling you guys what to do. No board likes anybody to tell them what oh, to I do. Don't. We don't want anybody to tell us what to do. But I'm wondering, maybe you could suggest, who would be the one who came up with the plan as to who's going to keep track of how well, these systems At are the working? moment, we count on the county to, mm -hmm. to keep track of things. Okay. And they notify us when they're, they're tracking whether the systems are, are performing the, the, up to standard. When they see a substandard system, they let us know, and we then track it down. But there are so, not too many systems right now. Oh, there are quite a few IAs in Falmouth. Oh, there are. And they really do stay on top of them? Yes. Yeah? Oh, yeah. yeah. They do. Okay. Because they, um, they, they, it's partly, as I understand it, John, the um, management contract people 
actually furnish the data. So they're required to, when they do their maintenance, to, re to record the data with the county. So that's how they help. Um, so, so that's how you're helping it, tracking how any George, George, has, George Hoyfelder has a person in his department yeah. at the county yep. who keeps track of all the IAs that have been installed on Cape Cod and, and monitors whether they're meeting the, the 19 milligrams per liter that they're supposed to and whether they're <coughs> keeping maintenance contracts. Right. Um, and there are over 1,500 of them. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. they didn't have anybody available this evening. We were hoping mm. to so have some discussion. On the Cape, or how many in town? 1,500. 1,500 on the Cape. A couple hundred? Probably, yeah. yeah. Come on. yeah we are, so, Mr. Kirk, I'm sorry, could you? Managing. Excuse me. Could you go to the podium? I'm sorry. As, as John is talking about at the present time, we, we actually talk with people to have them put in Title V systems, and they all go by the same way. I'm just going to borrow comments by Mike McGrath, who has overseen the other ones. And generally what happens is the homeowner has to pay for the monitoring, and there's a specific set of materials that he has to have monitored by a third party. In this case, usually he would hire another party or McGrath's engineering firm to come and monitor the system. Then out of that monitoring system, he pays a small amount each time. I, I may be small, but it's like $15 to get a copy of that information, which goes to George. And then George posts it on his major uh, material. Now, key aspect that George will always tell you when we talk about it, and John has sort of alluded to it too, is there's no, right now, enforcement capacity. Mm -hmm. There is a notification you aren't meeting <coughs> the projected goal, but there is no way right now where that can be enforced. Now, the, the homeowner involved with it, depending on how conscientious he is, much like maintaining non-nitrogen on your lawn areas. We have that law in Oyster Pond. Uh, that may be able to be um, um, worked into a situation like that um, and be acceptable in an area like the Oyster Pond. <coughs> I just thought I'd let it go. Thank you. So one other little piece. Um, we did by Board of Health the regulation a number of years ago say that any development, new development in town of five lots or more had to put in a denitrifying system that met 12 milligrams mm -hmm. per liter. In other words, we upped the standard to 12. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're quickly approaching the point where we can make that 10. And it's certainly, uh, I don't think as boards we should be installing 19 milligram systems anymore. Right. Right. We should be telling our vendors that if you're going to get a permit to put an IA system and you're going to ask people to put them in, that they at a minimum meet 12, and I think fairly shortly we'll be able to lower that to 10. And we can do that by Board of Health regulation. So yeah, I think it's a good, good point, but I'm wondering do we have hard enough data to know which systems are going to meet 10 or 12? We've got a list of them that are doing it in West Falmouth, <coughs> and George is putting together a list. Of yeah, but in West Falmouth, that's 20 systems or so. It's not. Um, Nine of which are tight tanks. Sorry? Not actually tight mm -hmm. tanks. Let me, let me just correct you. They are actually um, not systems. considered tight tanks because they have an overflow into the Title V system. Uh, they're, so a tight tank is. is, is Right, it's it would be a hundred percent. Yeah, it's mobile, right? Right. Minus three percent. By truck. No, no, that's right. Minus three percent. It's, right. It is it, the, the significant. The reason I'm bringing it up is because we you have to monitor them. You have to make sure they're pumped, but there will not be a public health failure if the tank tank bursts. It's going to go into a standard Title V system. No, no for his point, public health. And, and Beth's point was that there are only eleven systems. Denitrifying systems, and we have statistical data. Right, that's right. And we're putting, in, ten, and we're putting in ten more now. Yes, and then none of them are going to be okay. black water holding tanks. Right. And, so, and, yeah, go ahead. And, and the regulation 
that the committee's worked on that, that's been sent up, you know, for the state to consider now, involve at the municipal level a clear chain of responsibility for following up and making sure these systems are working. Right. It's not cast out. We have written a municipal management framework. That, we've identified a responsible management entity. We've talked about monitor, and we've got the whole thing written. I'm just thinking as a homeowner. Right. Mm -hmm. As a homeowner, you know, when I come home at 11 o'clock at night and I go out, take the dogs out and back, and I hear this water, and I go, that can't be my house, can it? It must be the house next door. And then I come back in and I hear water again, and I go, oh, no, I think it's my house. You know, and I go downstairs and I see, oh, this problem, the sump pump pipe has burst. I, I'm, I'm just thinking how complex it is for, for various, I mean, my house is in pretty good shape. I try to keep my house in good yeah. shape, but I don't know about all these kinds of things. We're trying to shine some light through Courtney's fog. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. But, we're but, trying but, not to run and grab while we do it. But, but we appreciate the fog. And one of the reasons that, that we're, you know, I said a couple of years, is because George Hoyfelter's intent was to do something that was non-proprietary, that could be easily installed, uh, that has just one pump, which is out in the yard, which does the dosing. Uh, and obviously we need the data to show that it's effective. He has tested <coughs> similar things at his test center, run through, you know, layers there, and both he and the DEP think that this is very promising. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we should keep that information under wraps, uh, and so it's partly why we wanted to I have a conversation. I just want to make sure it's as simple as possible. Of we course, so we all do. Not that I don't know yeah. any yeah. engineering, but it's like 11 o'clock at night. We yes, have to figure out. of course. Of and course. the plug is getting yes. water up to it. So we're not there yet, but but it, it looks like the, the path ahead might get brighter. I just want to follow up on something that Certainly John was important. talking about, which is, you know, the issue of um, uh, how to regulate and manage this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that a lot of areas already do this. And I, I um, own property in Olympia, Washington. Thurston County required did an annual had a requirement your septic system not denitrifying just any system <clears throat> had to be inspected and uh, you had to have a certificate of inspection submitted to the town by a certain time where they fire find you put a lien on your property and so on so I mean these kinds of mechanisms are Rhode Island. It just takes manpower, yeah. and when it's we got to that Rhode Island ticket, as well. it gives you incentive to be It made. sure does, yeah. 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 And well, it, it's and the manpower, and when we got to the issuing of tickets, it had to happen because we needed to make yeah. it happen. What, but what, yeah, what Thurston what, County did, they didn't themselves come out and do the inspection. They had people like set, licensed septic installers yeah. or so on yeah. that right. did, the, did it and submitted the paperwork to the town right. saying, we, we tested, this is what we found. Right. So this was not working. We made this repair, and, and that's what the that's what the yeah. management contract yeah. is set up. So when the IAs are approved, we say that you have to have the the con you have to have a contract set up. What was happened to these twenty plus is that the can contracts fell off. They didn't maintain the contract. Yeah. Then George didn't have any information, which then we knew nobody was maintaining it. So it, it just got to be this, and then you had to start writing tickets that had to be yeah. delivered to homeowners. In, in the case of the Thurston County thing, the county would send you a reminder to get it done. Oh yeah, the they got several letters yeah. <laughs> with <And> dates. <laughs> yeah. I do wonder though too, I mean, I think it's a good point and it sounds like that's where you're headed with, in terms of a management contract, but my feeling and you know a lot more about these IA systems than I do, is that at this point it's pretty much an art. It's not really clear why some systems work well and some systems don't. So, uh, well, we had the, the person who was running the, the maintenance contract come in and tell us it's getting 60 milligrams per liter because they use cleaning products. That's you know, one system and one person. Yeah, that's anecdotal, well, but, but, yeah. but this was the person who was supposed to know how the system works, right? And he wasn't fixing it. He just was throwing up his hands and telling us that it's it's cleaning products. So, if if it, I suspect right now, and I don't know for how much longer, it's going to be really hard to force people to reach a level 
consistently, right? Because, there, I mean, are we going to be finding the homeowner while the management company can't figure out how to make it function well? Because there are going to be a lot of times when that's the case. It's not functioning well and they don't know why. No, right? as part of the framework, what we started out by saying, you, you have to qualify a system. So the first step is to do the, the vetting of the technology so that you've monitored it in a piloting type of an application so that it's proven itself in real world environments for a couple of years. So you've monitored monthly, by, you know, every other month. And so you get, you get some performance data so you see some consistency. It's after that point that you start using these systems on a watershed basis. So I think where we're at right now is we're doing the, we're doing the prototyping. You know, we're alpha testing, we're beta testing, we're, we're trying to figure out which technologies seem to work better most of the time mm -hmm. and trying to learn working with, you know, good O&M companies how to dial them in. You know, what do you do with the seasonal home? I mean, this is exactly why we're doing this demonstration project to mm -hmm. understand how you dial the systems in, what it takes in the spring, what it takes in the fall. Um, you know, can we use just a media box and dose it properly and get good performance on a regular basis or are we getting numbers all over the place? And then we take those technologies that work <coughs> and those are the ones that become the workhorses for long-term watershed-wide implementation. But we have to do this piloting step first to see if we can even get systems that do better than 19. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the, the, the phase that we're at. And I think that's, if you look at any kind of uh, adoption of technology and advancement of technology, we're going through the phase that, that everybody has to go through. And so that's why we're doing it. I think you're both right, but you're talking about two different things. Mm -hmm. I think what Kevin is saying is, even when you have something tested six ways to Sunday, and there are a million of them in the country. One won't work. Or, or, well, or that, that would be a pretty good round. There, there will be a way for a homeowner and his kids to screw it up. Yeah. To screw it up. <laughs> and I believe I what we now, I let you go before you. I think this is my turn. Um, the, I think what our management plan said, and John can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the um, homeowner is ultimately responsible. Okay. They have to pay to get it fixed. Okay. If they're going to keep pouring bleach down it, they're going to have to keep paying for maintenance. Yep. And ultimately, if they do it too many times, they're not in good faith. And then the town has to be willing to be hard on it, which is very hard for a liberal town. But well, it's also, in principle possible. So we also had a number of failure criteria built into that management scheme. Mm -hmm. So if House A fails, House B and C are doing better than 10, mm -hmm. and they offset each other. That's so there, right. there are a number of ways that we built into that where we would average out still, as far as the yeah. state was concerned, making, uh, removing the amount of nitrogen in the watershed that we proposed to remove. And, and also, presumably, a $30,000 item is going to come with, hopefully, a multi-year warranty that's enforceable too. No homeowner, I hope, is going to just, oh, I want one of these off the shelf and don't worry about the warranty. I'm, I'm back in the fog I think, for a second. Um, one of the classic, this, this whole thing presents the classic problem of the advance of technology. Hmm. At what point do I, as the poor homeowner, decide to make that investment that two years from now is completely outmoded. Mm -hmm. And I know it's better than what it was before. Mm -hmm. I deliberately would, would refrain from mentioning that two and a half years or five years from now, there'll be some new magical thing that solves all this. <laughs> we'll spend thousands and millions of dollars. So that's why I'm getting but in the fog. you don't know. Yeah, no, no, I understand that. But it is a crapshoot and it is a dilemma. The other, the other thing that I want to talk a little bit about is the, uh, is in, uh, and it comes up, somebody just mentioned throwing bleach down the d -night system. And that gets to a sort of collateral thing. And I know it's not directly on the subject here, but it's one that every time it comes up, I like to make a mention of it, and particularly to this group. And that is, somebody mentioned in here, oh yes, well, if you have hazardous things that you would normally throw down the sewer, or now that there is a sewer, you can throw them down yeah. and not worry about it. They're gone. Uh, they glibly said, oh yes, the town has hazardous waste pickup. 
And that's a great thing, and it makes me feel good. But in truth, it's, there, it is not really, hazardous waste is not really very convenient for the average homeowner. Um, I invite you to come to my, the basement of my garage. <laughs> it's, it's a toxic waste dump. And the reason it is, is because I can't get rid of those things because it just happens on the day that um, they'll collect them, I'm out of town. I always tell them, I always tell them, it's Falmouth once a year, and it's each of the towns once a year, and I always tell him when Mashpee is, so this is no excuse. No, 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 but I, I mean, in other words, what I think the goal should be in something like this, and I'm speaking to the selectmen, I'm speaking to all of you, is that we should have a goal of making hazardous waste collection easier, more frequent, so that people are, are encouraged to go and get rid of them rather than properly. properly, rather than pouring it on the ground, down their septic, in the sewer, and so on. So that, that's just uh, an aside. Well, mm. that gives me a good segue because I think that's really a, a, uh, a matter of public awareness. And in that sense, I will talk about our little update and our standard conditions. Um, when we issue an order of conditions for a project that comes before us to do um, some work within our jurisdiction, um, the order of conditions comes with a list of standard conditions, which, like they sound, it, you know, goes along with every order. And then um, there also is a list of uh, special conditions that are tailor-made to the situation at hand. Um, so about a month ago, and at Virginia's urging, we were happy to be able to do something to help, um, we adopted two new standard conditions that um, are closely related to the nitrogen control bylaw. Um, we adopted two because the first one um, merely reminds the applicant that everybody in Falmouth has to abide by these nitrogen control bylaw standards. Um, and then the second one, um, the second condition we adopted is pretty much the same thing except that it applies further to a few other resource areas under our jurisdiction that are not covered by the town nitrogen control bylaw. And so those are um, land subject to coastal flowage, that kind of thing, and also um, the Black Beach Great Sipawissett Marsh District of Critical Planning Concern, um, which we refer to as the DCPC for obvious reasons, and then also the Wakoit Bay Area of Critical Environmental Concern. So um, that was, you know, it's a long way from an idea that we had kicked around of discussing possible um, amendment to our uh, regulations to cover denitrifying systems, and I think it's very clear from what we've been saying here tonight that that would have been very premature. Um, but it's on the radar screen. But this was something we could do, and we appreciate your appreciation for this modest contribution. And it's the fertilizer bylaw. It's the fertilizer, the fertilizer bylaw. Fertilizer bylaw. Yeah. And it was passed by town meeting. It applies to all properties within 100 feet of an estuary. Uh, and makes windows for when not to apply fertilizers and when you can, um, and prohibitions during heavy rain and obviously not during the winter and so on. So it's, it's an education process, uh, and uh, I, I, I think that um, town meeting clearly had that intent, and we're now basically getting it implemented, and you're a key piece. Thanks. Betsy. Yeah, and actually it came up in the Slutman's meeting the other night about um, oh. Funding the uh, mailing. Funding the mailing and also the suggestion, was it your suggestion? But it wanted somebody's suggestion that any place that we're, we're fertilizer, fertilizer is sold, sold, it should be posted. Yep. I mean, apparently it's sent there, but you know. Eric said we'll look into that, so we will. Right. It needs to get in the hands of landscapers too. Yes. Right. Yes. We're, well, a I, we're writing we're, a letter. We're writing a letter yeah. that we sent to all the landscapers. I thought that was a yeah, good idea. I, I think, well, my impression is the landscapers are 
or well, well no, this is commercial, the large commercial landscape. Yeah, they, pretty well reminder. informed. I'm not sure about the, you know, the guys with their own small. pickup trucks, but the small, yeah. <laughs> yes, or the small land owners, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah, a list of landscapers in, in uh, Falmouth would be quite quite a list. Mm, yes. <laughs> we were just talking about that today. That's right. <laughs> how, how do we put this list together? Every male under 40. <laughs> <laughs> right. Every male under 40. <laughs> That's oh. Pretty females, too. <laughs> well, that was terrific. Um, is, is there anybody in the public who would like to, uh, has anything they want to ask about or comment on? I just wanted, if I could, certainly on the Born Pond Inlet. Mm -hmm. um, on all of these, we're, we're going to meet it without soaring. The, the impact of, of the opening the inlet does not clear the entire pond. And uh, those of us who live on the little blue line up there at the top of Born Pond realize that it's going to have virtually no impact on the upper ends of there. So the alternatives would be the shell fishing, or uh, IAs. Or, or IAs. permeable reactive or barrier. <laughs> yeah, Born's Pond, we've looked at uh, the inlet does 50%, so it gets half of the nitrogen. So it does a yeoman's work. Oh, absolutely. And then the other half is uh, the plan right now calls for shellfish and a permeable reactive barrier. Right. I think that uh, half of the removal is rejected. <laughs> right. I understand. Yes. And the other half is right. Right. Yeah. modeled. <laughs> Yes, Peter. Uh, could you explain uh, a little bit more about the inlet whitening? Uh, I'm hearing a lot of money for sewering and IA and so forth. And with Bourne's Pond by whitening the inlet, maybe we could save 50%. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if you had, if you, had some uh, of the box thinking like on Great Pond, having another uh, additional bridge, a second bridge that would be wider and deeper and having uh, more dredging action in Great Pond, uh, that could be perhaps more economical or a portion of uh, reducing the soaring or whether an inlet should be widened was looked at for each estuary that was <coughs> part of what the Massachusetts estuary project was charged with doing so they had to model and and they this is with actual data measuring tidal in and out uh, over a number of cycles and actually over more than a month. Um, so every inlet was looked at. The other inlets are what they call efficient. There is no retardation of the tide. It manages to come in and go out uh, and, and uh, so the, the, the heights inside the pond are um, the measured, follow the, the correct pattern with, with the height of the tide from the outside. The only inlet that was, that did have a tide that was retarded was Bourne's Pond. And so from the very first study in the early 2004 time frame, uh, that particular pond was identified as having uh, another approach other than sewering. Um, and which was to widen the inlet. And when the research was done about what was the historical width of the inlet, it was approximately 100 feet wide. Uh, there was an effort made in, by the town in 1986 to actually get that 100 feet, but at that time for dy dynamics we don't really totally understand, the state only permitted us to widen it to 50 feet. Hmm. Uh, so basically, we're, uh, we've done new bathymetry, new modeling, uh, and it turns out the optimal size for the tide coming in and out is 90 feet. So that's what the plan is that's, that's now working its way through permitting. But it wouldn't do us any good in, in the other estuaries because they're already as big as, as they need to be. They need to be to have tidal prism. There's no dampening of that. 
that, and the other thing, the, the thing that ultimately drives the flushing is the tidal amplitude. And the entrance of Great Pond has almost the smallest tidal amplitude of any open coast site on the entire east coast mm -hmm. because of the dynamics of the way the, the forcing tidal waves, uh, forcing column tidal waves, the, the different large masses of water that are moving around the coast and wrapping around the cape and coming up from the Buzzard Bay side, they, they almost cancel each other out. Right, right about Falmouth Heights, right about the entrance to Falmouth Harbor. So that's a factor also. There's just not a whole lot of tidal difference there. But on your, on your point, though, we, we've also been looking at salt ponds and the possibility of putting in a second inlet for that and then valving it so that there's actually a circulation created. In other words, one, one of the openings would be outflow, one would be inflow, and then circulate. And this is being explored now, but that, that's another option that's being looked at. A couple of years, that's going to be underwater anyway. Yeah. Well, it's not harbor. It's all going to be a harbor. It's going to 20, be 27 months, right? That's easy. 27 harbor. months? Yeah, you said a couple of years. <laughs> oh, no, I know. Or as of Friday night. We'll see. <laughs> yes. Before we, before we finish this plan, right. 40 years, 50, 60 years from now. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, from the standpoint of, you know, suggestions about building another bridge even separately from whether or not we would need it, a widening. I think we also do need to think about trade-offs in investing in infrastructure, coastal infrastructure, and you know we might be, want to be retreating rather than building, retreating back from Surf Drive. It remains to be seen, but mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. rather than building fancy yeah. new bridges. So. Well, one, of, one of the uh, outlandish thoughts that I have is maybe having a large connector through all the ponds <laughs> <laughs> so that it would circulate. <laughs> well, the Conservation Commission would have to approve that. Yeah. <laughs> We're prepared to move forward. Right, that would take many. Uh, from the canal. Hearings. Get it. Come here. Messy. Come here. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All those in favor say hi. Aye. 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 Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.